Let me turn on there. Okay, good. Good morning. It's good to see you today. Um, a couple of things we start out. Well, last week we were gone. We were at Florida for the 100th birthday party of a, lady, of a woman we call Ann Violet, who was in my mom and dad's wedding. So we went to for her 100th, wedding, her 100th uh, birthday party on Monday. It was a great time. Loves the Lord. Uh, she served God for many years. One of those that, you know, not many people come to a 100th birthday party. She's outlived everybody, you know. She's down in Florida, so uh, it's really good. Yeah, we brought Joshua back. He's cup holder, so he's pretty happy about that. Uh, <laughs> at any rate. Um, uh, where's Billy? Uh, did he walk out? Yeah, he meets, there he is. Got a new drummer here. It's going to be from some time to time, so uh, thank you very much. So if you saw him up there, that's... Uh, Billy's uh, joined us, and that's great. I also want to throw out uh, for Retta uh, an encouragement. Um, she's, going to f she's going to Hungary, and we have Abby Brothers, who is going to Wildwood for an evangelistic tour. Um, th these girls together probably need about seven grand, I'm thinking, and we will send them, okay? We need to send them. Some of you folks can put them one dollar, that's it. Some of you could drop a thousand dollars into their missions thing. You're really committed, and you want to see them go. I will tell you, this is a great experience. Most, many of them knew, uh, many of the missionaries we put on the field today come from having an experience in a short run mission trip. Now, don't take your tithe money and put it into that. We'll be, we'll be, we'll be uh, having service in the dark because we won't be able to pay the electric bill, okay? But uh, this is a chance for you to step out in faith and say, hey, I want to, these girls are meaningful to us and we want to see them go. I will tell you that Retta has been super committed to this, uh, to the um, Solid Rock Youth Center. I mean, she is, she's an um, intern for an assistant director this year. Next year, we won't have her. She's starting on, going, moving on to her master's program, and it's a big disappointment. We kind of hope she would kind of fit in there and continue to stay. Maybe she'll come back. But uh, she has been actively involved, probably more so than uh, a lot of us who sit here. But uh, right along with the other interns, she's been, every Friday and Saturday, she's going above, be called, above and beyond the call of duty. So uh, she really warrants our support. So uh, we hope her home church will come through with a, a sizable gift. But uh, I want us to be confident that we can uh, help her get to that mission field for this year. And she's done a great job for us. And uh, we've given her a little bit of a scholarship for working at the South of the Rock Youth Center, but nowhere near uh, the ca capacity of what she's done. So we thank her for that. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 2 today. And we're going to be going through um, uh, Peter's. Peter still is trickling through the first 12 chapters of Acts. So I thought we'd stay with Acts for a while and um, uh, go through Peter's life and some of the things that he's done because we're going to see a changed Peter. And, and to just see the Peter before the resurrection is a kind of a jip. when I mean, you get to see what he's like after the resurrection and what the resurrection does in someone's life. And um, uh, Pastor Ed last week talked about uh, the assignment of, a, um, of another uh, uh, witness, another disciple. And we're going to talk about this week, we're going to go on to the second chapter where uh, Peter preaches his first public sermon, you might say. And Acts is a book of firsts. So in other words, Acts is a kind of a transition book showing how we got to where we are. So we're going to find a lot of stuff in the book of Acts that tells us how the church was started and what's important today. So if you'll turn to Acts chapter 2, we're um, actually going to start, we're going to go back into chapter 1 for a brief second. But uh, we have a video. Um, it's on DVD. We're not sure how clear it's going to be. We're going to try it and see if best we can. So instead of reading verses 1 through 16 of chapter 2, we're going to play them. So uh, if you'll kind of listen along and look at look at the video. We'd like to see how this goes. Go ahead, Sean. give an introduction. My, there, my, first, my first point actually goes back to chapter 1. So if you'll take Acts chapter 1, if you get this up, just yell at me, Sean, and we'll, we'll play it after this first point here. Acts chapter 1 is um, verses 4 through 8 is the beginning part of Acts where Jesus Christ is just going to heaven. And if you remember looking back at this section, it's the part, and I want to go back to verse 4, it says this. And gathering them together, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for what the Father had promised, which he said, you heard from me. For John baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. 
And then he goes on in verse 8 and says, a verse that you all know pretty well, but you shall be my witnesses, or you shall receive power, and if that, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and under the uttermost parts of the earth, and so forth. So as we look at this, there's a couple things I want to point out. If you're taking notes, just write on your notes here. First thing is, don't leave Jerusalem, he told them. Don't leave Jerusalem. Then I add the word, yet. Stay. Stay put. Because they did not have the power they needed to go out and um, witness and do the things that they needed because they didn't have the Holy Spirit yet. So he said, wait in Jerusalem. Uh, it's interesting because in verse 8, he tells them, go, you know. Go out and, and preach the gospel and go to the Jerusalem and all these other places. But here he says, wait, because something has to happen first. We need to make, we, he needed to make sure that they had the Holy Spirit's uh, power in their lives. And in John chapter 16, verse 7 uh, through 15, remember, he said, you know, um, I'm going to leave, but the Holy Spirit is going to come. And when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to, you know, give you power and, and you'll get the comforter. So we need to wait as we do things. He says, you need to wait for the, the Spirit that I've told you is going to come. And in fact, in John chapter 7, verse 39, he says, but this he spoke in the Spirit, whom those who believed in him were to receive. This is Jesus speaking. For the Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So when Jesus had to get glorified, so, he's, so he had to raise from the dead and so forth, and he had to leave, ascend into heaven, and then God was going to send the Holy Spirit to be with them. So he says, wait. Um, don't leave Jerusalem, but wait for the Spirit. Now, it's kind of interesting. This is important because it's, a, it's, it's the first time that believers receive the Holy Spirit, and from now on, things would change. It would be a permanent residency. If we read in Romans 8 and 9, it says, However, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit dwells in you. If anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So everybody gets the Spirit. Okay, there's a lot of questions about that. When do you get the Spirit? When do you get to the Holy Spirit? When does it come to your life? When does it come to your life? When? At the moment of salvation. Because if he didn't, Paul couldn't write that if you don't have the Spirit of Christ, you're not saved. So as soon as we get saved, we receive the Holy Spirit. But that was not true in the first time. They were waiting for the Holy Spirit at this point to get the Holy Spirit, and then from then on, people, believers would have him forever. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, you probably know this. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Okay? Temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you are from God, for you are not your own. You've been brought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body. He could not say that if there were some believers who didn't have the Holy Spirit. He could only say you are the temple of the Holy Spirit if every believer has the Spirit. And that is true. So at the moment of regeneration, we get the Holy Spirit. However, he had not come yet. So they were to wait. Now I was in one um, sermon, uh, one of my kids' friends was Pentecostal, charismatic, and we went out for a special event at their house, and so we went to the service that morning. We went to the church. And their pastor used this passage, and the entire, the entire sermon was on wait. You have to wait for the Holy Spirit. Wait for the Holy Spirit. He wanted, and he was preaching that the people had to wait for the Holy Spirit, you know, and I mean, he had to, you know, just wait for this, whatever it was. And I said, that's not what the text says. He was talking to the disciples, wait to get the Holy Spirit, but once that took place, people got the Holy Spirit as soon as they were saved. And his whole sermon was wrapped around the fact of waiting and, and trying to get the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, you don't need to be baptized by the Holy Spirit. You got the baptism of the Holy Spirit the day you became saved. You were baptized by the Spirit into the body of Christ. And that's what the scriptures teach. So, in, in any case, so he said, wait. And then the, the next thing we go to, verse 8, and I'll say these two things, and then we'll see if that um, video works on chapter 2, is first of all, it says in verse 8, he says, you shall receive power. And the word power there is dunamis in the Greek, which means similar dynamite we have now, dynamite. So, you know, my wife says, you don't laugh at nothing in shows and stuff. You know what I like? I, like, I laugh at the shows where there's a lot of explosions and stuff like that, especially if it's funny. Tim Taylor is one of my favorites, and I don't think I've time to tell you that whole episode. It was just great. Uh, you know, he, it was one of the, oh, well, I got it. Oh. The episode where Tim Taylor comes up, you know, and they're, they're fixing this guy's gas furnace, and he said, did you fix the leak in the gas furnace? Told to Al, and Al says, yeah, I fixed the leak, leak in the gas furnace. And, and he said, well, he said, did you get the ga leak in the stove? And he said, the stove? You didn't tell me about a leak in the stove. Yeah, well, he said, I already turned the gas back on. He said, that's okay. All the electricity is turned off. He said, you turn electricity off the house? No. He said, but it's all off. He said, the only thing is that lamp in the front, the front window. He said, um, that's one of those, you know, clapper kind of lamps, but that's off too. Just then Tim comes up. What are you guys standing around for? Get to work. 
light bulb comes up, gas explodes, the whole house goes away. That's what I like. I'm, I'm sorry. That's what I like to laugh at. But <laughs> anyway, dynamite. You will receive power. That's what we get when we talk to, when we, when we have the Holy Spirit in our lives, we need God's power in our life. And we'll kind of end up with that theme also. And, and um, I, let me just, some of you like old songs. I, I, I threw this on Sean, and he was, I didn't expect him to do anything. He did it anyway. We've got a great tech team. They do stuff, you know, that you don't even see. But uh, some of you probably will talk about the old songs. Okay, here's an old song. Put it, put it up there, the next uh, slide there. And I don't know, have you folks ever heard of this song, Pentecostal Power? How many people ever heard of the Pentecostal Power? Let's, let's just sing a verse of it, okay? Lord, as of old at Pentecost, thou didst thy power display with cleansing, purifying power. Descend on us today. Oh. My voice isn't as great anymore. Come on, help me out with the chorus if you know it. Send the old time power. sing it once a year, right, for when we used to. Um, it's kind of funny. It's got, it's got a lot of jazzy stuff you can do on it, and I only practiced about halfway once, but uh, when I was in college or seminary, they used to tell me, look, if you want to grow your church worship team, and back then it was all piano and organ, they said, go down to the local Pentecostal church and hire their pianist for your church. <laughs> then you'll be okay. You'll have some spirit in your church, but at any rate. So uh, Pentecostal power, important Okay, but we have the power of God in us. We need to know that. So too many people walk today around with as weaklings. They don't have any power because they don't realize they get the Holy Spirit living in them. They think I'm going to have some experience or something. That's not true. We are all occupied and indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Now, the last thing it says, it says, you shall be my witnesses. The word witnesses in the Greek is actually martyrs, and it's similar to the word martyr. It became to be used in English because so many of the early witnesses were killed, and even today they are being killed. I just saw on Fox News uh, two nights ago, I think, there's a, a, a Turkish pastor, who, uh, or actually an English pastor, I think, a missionary, maybe, um, and he's a Turkish, he's been in Turkey for 30 years, and they just imprisoned him as a spy. And, uh, you know, they, they're asking President Trump to make overtures to try to get him out, but his wife is devastated. Here's her husband, 30 years of ministry in Turkey, and all of a sudden now he's a spy. You know, and put in prison. Uh, people are in prison around the world. People are being killed, martyrs for the cause of Christ. And that's what it means to witness, to be a witness. In Acts one twenty two, it says, one of these, um, this is the sermon from last week, it says, one of these should become a witness with us of his resurrection. Jesus usually sent them out two by twos. They were missing one because Jesus was gone. So they picked another guy to fill out the 12. So they had six sets of people to go out and witness to the gospel around the world. Um, in, when it talks about Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost parts of the world, uh, we could say Morrisville, or Lower Makefield Town, uh, Lower, Lower Makefield, uh, Lower Bucks, Pennsylvania, United States, and the rest of the world. We're responsible to do that, and we do that by ourselves going sometimes, such as to Hungary, by sending our missionaries like Tony and Gwen and others to our seats, and sometimes it's us that get to do it right here at home. And that's why that's an important part of what we do as an outreach. Uh, this also kind of matches, and I'll, with this we'll go and see if we can do that uh, uh, chapter 2 again, uh, Sean. Um, as you look through Acts, Acts does not incorporate everything that the church says or does. But what it does is it brings up things that are firsts. And so this is the first time that, we'll, that, that people are baptized or receive the Holy Spirit, so he talks about that. Later on, there will be a couple other things, and we'll talk about that, where they, um, the, the Holy Spirit is given at other parts, and it's a newer thing. Uh, you'll have Cornelius, who was a Gentile. That's going to be talked about. Then you have um, John's um, disciples, who were outside of Palestine. So each one of these who record as special events, but that's not the norm. That's how it happened at the very beginning. Once Acts proves that the Holy Spirit has given to everybody, and the Jews who are reading Acts understand that the Holy Spirit comes on everybody who's a believer, regardless of whether they're in Palestine, Jew, Gentile, outside of Palestine. Once they understand that, 
The Holy Spirit comes on us at the moment of salvation, which is why Paul writes what he, what he does right. Uh, can we try that again, uh, Sean? See if it works. We're not going to hear Joel, so we'll, we'll talk about, about that a little bit. But that's basically, and as you saw in the bottom right corner, we may use this a few other weeks. The bottom right corner had the text. It's actually the text of the scripture being read, and I'll tell you exactly what verse it is. So let's take a look once again, if we can, at, um, at um, Acts chapter 2, and let's just go through this. This is a very important text for a number of reasons. Not only is it the start of the church, not only is it the baptism of the Holy Spirit, but it's the only place in scriptures where the gift of tongues is specifically stated and shown what it is. In other places it talks about it, but here are the details of what actually encompasses that particular gift so that we know and understand what it is. Um, it's, uh, I, my son loves to watch NCIS. How many people watch NC, or know what NCIS is? Okay? Everybody knows Gibbs, okay? What does Gibbs have in this basement? Ah, boat. Thank you very much. So let, let me give you an illustration. Let's, let's say I'm writing a book about Gibbs, okay? And so I've, I've the detail Gibbs. I've watched all the episodes. I talk to him, and I find out all about boat making, and I, I start writing a book about him. The second chapter of my book is dedicated to how to make a boat based on, you know, Gibbs going down there, sanding the right way and doing all the kind. I got all the details in chapter two. Perfect. 
And then I go on, and then I, uh, Gibbs, eventually, at some point in his life, he winds up traveling, and he goes over to Europe, and he, and, he, and he gets in touch with some agents over there. And besides doing their cases, they also wind up doing, he winds up showing them how to make boats. And so I refer to that in the, in, the, in, the, in the book. I say, and he shows them how to make boats out in uh, Europe. You know, and then, and then later on, um, we wind up with, uh, let's say, Abby, you know, who's very particular. She winds up going over to Israel, you know, for a trip to meet one of her Mossad friends, you know, or whatever. She goes over there, and um, I, I, I note that when she gets over there, guess what she does? She teaches them how to make a boat, okay? So I say, she goes over and teaches them how to make a boat. And I'll write the rest of the story. Now, let me ask you, when I described, when I s described the features of boat making in chapter two, I was very detailed and accurate, okay? When I mentioned that Gibbs goes over to Europe and just in a, in a very short episode talk about him teaching his fellow agents there how to make, how to make a boat based on how he does it, um, what would you expect that to be like? I make no description, but I just say that he's teaching them how to make boat. What do you think took place when that happened? What's the boat look like? Same thing as in chapter two, exactly. I mean, he didn't build, he didn't build a, you know, an ark or teach him how to make an ark. He didn't, he didn't change the proportions of the boat. He taught him exactly the same. Now, I didn't say that because I already told you chapter two what it's like, okay? And then Abby goes out to, to, uh, to uh, you know, Israel and she gets with some of her Mossad friends and I said, she taught them how to make a boat. What do you think their boat looked like? Same thing as chapter two, right? Don't have to go on explanation. It's already in chapter two. Such is what I believe we're looking at here. What happens is they have a description, and Luke is the writer in Acts, and he describes in Acts in very much detail what the gift of tongues looked like the very first time. And we're going to look at that in a few minutes. And then we wind up with Peter being called up to see Cornelius. And in fact, he says, they received the gift of the Spirit the same way they did when we were at Pentecost. So it was the exact same thing. Luke does not go into a whole lot of description. It doesn't tell what the languages were there. It doesn't tell what languages they spoke or anything. He just says, they spoke in tongues. And Peter says the same way we did before. And then they go along, and, and Paul goes out to Corinth in Genesis 12, 13, and 14, you know. And, it say, and, and this church was a, which was a church where they may have been speaking in tongues and somewhat because... The, Corinth was this little isthmus where all the boat people would take their, instead of going all the way around the bottom of Italy, that, or of, 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 of um, Greece, excuse me, of Greece, all the way to the bottom, they would go, th they would take the boats out, actually out of the water and roll them on logs across the isthmus. So Corinth became the crux of prostitution, gambling, I mean, anything you want, it was in Corinth, you could get it there. And the church was also very carnal. And so while they may have had a lot of people they could have spoken in tongues to that had different languages there. They also wound up uh, getting very proud and using the gift in the wrong way. And Paul actually scolds them in there. And I think a little tongue-in-cheek makes a little bit of fun of them in some places. He says, you know, <laughs> you guys have no love in Corinth. He says, you just got it all wrong. You want these gifts. He says, if I, had the, if I, had, if I could speak in the tongues of men and of angels, it would mean nothing if I didn't have love. And then he goes and he says, if you guys are speaking in, in tongues and you're doing it so that, it, you know, so that you can have a big audience with somebody, he said, it's meaningless. If nobody understands it, go in your closet and talk, you know. Maybe God will understand you there because nobody else sure does. You're not doing any good because the purpose of gifts in general were given to edify the body of Christ. If nobody understands what you're saying, what are you doing? You're just drawing attention to yourself and doing a bunch of gobbledygook. Might be, might be accurate. I don't know, but it's not doing anybody any good. Go in your closet, put it someplace else, you know? Because this gift is for different something. So he scolds Corinth on what they were doing. When we read about Corinth, is there any reason where, now understand, Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, was what in relationship to Paul? Who was he in relationship to Paul? Yeah, he was a traveling partner. He was a doctor. He was, a, he, was their, he was his physician. So he traveled with Paul. So when he describes what's happening with a Luke chapter 2, he knows what's happened with Paul. He knows about Corinth. He knows about all this stuff that's going on. And so there's nothing different in Corinth 
Should be nothing different. Corinth there is in Acts chapter 2. So this is a very important chapter because here he describes exactly what tongues are like. And if we're going to say somebody has the gift of tongues, we've got to go back to Acts chapter 2 and say, is this what it's like? Because if it's not like what Luke describes, then it's not tongues. It could be something else, but it's not the gift of tongues as associated. So let's take a look at this. And you saw, you've seen what happens a little bit here. Let's take a look at this particular uh, detail here and, and look at what happened and how it happened. And the first thing I say is, where did this happen? So I'm going to do the where, what, when, how, that all kind of stuff. Okay, today as we go through the sermon. So the where, uh, chapter 2, verse 1, it says, And when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. Now, it doesn't tell us where. Like, some think they were in the upper room. Some think they might have been the temple. We don't really know. They pictured them here in the upper room. But everybody was hearing them in their own languages, so maybe they were in the temple. Because people were hearing them. It wasn't like, you know, these are few people here in an in a, in a individual spot. And there were three feasts that everybody was required to go to Jerusalem on. One was Passover. The second one was uh, Tabernacles, which happened right after Passover. And the third one was Pentecost. Pentecost was originally called, if you look in Leviticus chapter 23, it was originally called first fruits or harvest. This is when the harvest comes, and actually be, it'll be in the, um, in the month of May this year for us. Okay, it's 50 days after, after Passover. And so all the people were required to come. So they had all these people from all over the world, all these Jews from all over the world, coming to Israel. What better time for the Holy Spirit to come and fill these disciples. What better time for them to preach the gospel to all these people who are coming from all over the place? Because what's going to happen? They're going to be back to their homeland. It's, it's a little bit the same opportunity we have in some ways with college evangelism today. Because we can't go to a lot of closed countries and witness to them about Jesus Christ, can we? A little bit risky to go to Iran, although we have a, I think there's a pastor there still in prison over, over being, over an orphanage he had there, a Christian orphanage. But it's difficult to go there, but guess what? Those students are coming here. And you go to a typical university, you've got all kinds of students from all over the world. And that's kind of what happens here. All people from all over the world are coming. Jews, they come here and they hear the gospel in their own language, their own dialect, and that's what it says here. So when did this happen? It happened at the Feast of Pentecost, which was a very important place. So it was, it was perfectly timed. And then the second thing we find is what they saw. And in verses uh, 2 and 3, we see you saw it and heard it. The rushing and violent wind, okay, they saw. And then also the uh, tongues of fire. Now, the, the wind, here's another interesting thing. The word for wind in Greek is pneuma, okay? It can be translated wind or spirit. Because when you breathe... It's your spirit, you know, you're, you're breathing breath, and the spirit leaves you when you what? Stop breathing, okay? Wind and breath are the same thing. So pneuma, if you have a problem in your lungs, it's sometimes called pneumonia, okay? So pneuma is the word for, so it says a rushing violent wind, it says the word pneuma. So we have the Holy Spirit looking at in, in this particular text. Then you have the tongues of fire. What do the tongues of fire represent? I think it represents God's presence. Look at the Old Testament. Moses and the burning bush, fire, God's presence. Take off your sandals, your holy ground. Um, uh, Elijah, up on Mount Carmel, you know, making fun of all the Baal guys. They can't get down fire, and he says, he may, puts all kinds of water about him and what happened over the altar, and what happens? Fire from heaven comes down, takes it. Fire. Uh, John the Baptist even said when he was preaching these words in Luke 3.16, he, referring to Jesus, will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. So this was a time, the, the tongues of fire represented to those that happened to be seeing it, these people were being filled with God, God the Holy Spirit. And they were going to be able to serve him and be witnesses because they had the Holy Spirit now. They had the power of the Holy Spirit. What happened? Verse uh, 4 uh, in the beginning part, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. It's called baptism of the Holy Spirit in chapter 1 verse 5. They were baptized by the Holy Spirit. Now, again, we have a, we have a, excuse me, I have to say we have a right definition. <laughs> we, we, we translate the word baptizo and it means what? Immerse. Okay? These people were immersed with the Holy Spirit. They were, they were placed into the body of Christ, placed into, immersed. 
baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. This is the first day of the church. And so we say baptized, we don't, but, but that, those words give you a little bit better understanding of what was happening here. These people were being filled with the Holy Spirit. It wasn't just, oh, we've got the Holy Spirit for a little bit or whatever. They were being filled with the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 they were being completely controlled. So what happened? That's what happened. And in first, and if you look in um, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, Paul says, For by one spirit we were all baptized or immersed into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. So when the Spirit, Holy Spirit comes upon us, he immerses us into the church, which is why I believe that Every person that's a part of the universal church should be a member of some local church. But this is a unique time. This passage here is the only time in Scripture when the universal church and the local church were one and the same. All believers in Jesus Christ who were part of the universal church were present here, to my knowledge. This was the local church. After this, we'll find out, find out next week as we look at it, that 3,000 people got saved. After that, church gets big. After these people go home and get saved, some of these people get saved and they go home, the church is now dispersed. And there are many local churches. And there will be the universal church of everybody that's a believer in Jesus Christ, but then there's a local church. And people who are part of the universal church should also be part of a local church. The problem is, some people today think if you're part of a local church, you're part of the universal church. And some people... Get church, become church members, but don't believe in Jesus Christ. Don't hold to what he has. They just, they've got a church membership. So we have to realize that church membership does not, inc does not reflect the fact that we're God's children, unless, like our church, we make you give us testimony as best as possible, try to make sure you know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. But if you come into a church just because, you know, you got sprinkled or you got, you know, had an experience or the elders wanted you to be a part of it or whatever, there may be unbelievers in that church. And there could be an unbeliever that sneaks into our church or whatever. But anybody who's a believer in Jesus Christ and a part of the universal church should be part of the local church. And here's where it took place. Then the verses 2, uh, 4 to 6 and 9 through 11, what did they hear? Well, they heard tongues. Now, your, ver your Bible just says tongues. The, the, there are two words they used in the, in the um, Acts here. One is glossa, G-L-O-S-S-A, and uh, sometimes when you hear about the tongues, you'll hear glossolalia. That's what they call them, okay? That comes from glossa, which is the word. The other two words are used are dialectos. What's that sound like? Dialect. Language. So tongue means language. Dialectos means dialect. So it might be like in Africa, they might have a language, but they got 50 different dialects of that language. Well, the dialect. So it's very, very clear that what the ref Luke's referring to, he's making very clear what the words he's using. These are dialects, these are known languages that everybody knows, that are you, not everybody, but somebody knows in the world that they're using. They're known languages, but they are unknown to who? The speaker. The speaker doesn't know it. That's the gift of tongues. So the speaker doesn't know the language, but the people he's speaking to do know the language. So they're understanding it, and that's what we have indicated here. What did they hear? It's um, John, um, Charles Rowley puts it this way. They speak in real languages new to the speakers and understood by those from various lands who were in Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. It was the first uh, evangelistic sermon that went around to everybody. Now we look at um, what was this thing called tongues. Um, you need to keep in mind, this is what tongues are. So when you go to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, and a lot of the newer translations don't, if you have a King James Bible, okay, and it has in it some word in italics, the italics is not in the original. Okay, that's why they put in italics, because they want to be very careful. The italicized word is a word that the, um, the translators put in to help you understand that particular passage. That's well, not bad. In fact, it's very good because they put it in italics so you know exactly what's there. But if you look at 1 Corinthians 14, you'll see that the word unknown is in italics all the time, and there's money on those because they spoke in unknown tongues. So somebody reading it says unknown tongue. That must be some sort of a gibberish or an angel, angel language or something like that, but that's not, what it, that's not what it means. What it means is by unknown tongue, it means a tongue, a language, a dialectos, not known to the speaker but known to the person he's talking to. So the unknown language, 
when you, when you look at Acts 2, it helps us translate 1 Corinthians 14. And so we need to translate 1 Corinthians 14 when it talks about tongues and spiritual gifts and all this kind of stuff the way it is shown in Acts chapter 2. So to be more specific as he goes through here, he doesn't want to be, uh, doesn't want to be not clear. Of the, re the responses of the people are, what is happening here? And you look at verse 7. They were amazed and marveled. Why are all these... Why are not all these people Galileans? And how is it we hear them speak in our own language? Now, I don't know if they, I don't think they were all Galileans, but the Peter, James, John, Andrew, Nathaniel, at least five of them were from Galilee, and maybe more. So they're seeing these Galileans and think, these are, these are, these are dumb fishermen. How can they speak in a language of somebody else? And so that's the question. And in verse 12, after the explanation, they also get perplexity, but, and they continue in amazement and great perplexity, saying, what does this mean? Now, what were the languages? It's in verses nine, um, basically 9 through 11. And if you can go to the next slide, um, I'm not sure, yes. Here's, the, here's a picture of where the languages are from. So if you look at these, I'm just going to go th quickly through them. Parthenians, uh, that was modern Iraq, okay? In fact, it's interesting. And I, you don't realize this. What took place in Iraq many, many years ago? The 70 year, well, Tower of Babel was near there, yes, which is very interesting when you talk about tongues because the tongues is actually a reversal of the Tower of Babel. Babel, God confused their long tongues. Here they gave them the ability to speak in unknown tongues, which is very interesting. I think that's great. Um, but if you look back at Iraq, the Babylonian captivity took place there. I never realized how many Jews stayed in Babylon. You know, when we talk about now, there are the, the Jewish population with the, with the, uh, you know, the new radicals taken over, the population of Jews in, in Iraq has gone super low. But it, it used to be a humongous community, and they, they thrived there ever since the Babylonian captivity because a lot of them never went back. In fact, there was a modern movement called Operation Ezra and Nehemiah. We, did, we went through that, those books to try to get Jews from Babylon to move and transport them to Israel, especially considering the tough times. So at this time, there was a thriving, massive community of Jews in Iraq, but they had to go to Jerusalem for this feast. So they went to Jerusalem for the feast and heard, him, heard them speak in the language of Iraq, or whatever they were speaking at that particular time, the, Parthen the um, Parthenians. And there, then there were Medes, that was part of Iran. You had the Elamites, which was southwest Iran. Mesopotamia means between the rivers, which is the Tigris and Euphrates, also Iraq. Then you have, he goes to different parts. Now he goes over to Asia Minor, which is Turkey. You can see Turkey there. He mentions Cappadocia, Pontus, Phrygia, and some others. Um, the southwest of the Black Sea. And so you can see Turkey there. Then he went to Egypt. What happened in Egypt? We had the captivity, but most of those Israelites came out. But then after that captivity, when they went to Babylonian captivity, remember, a lot of them didn't want to get transported to Babylon in the end. So they went to Egypt, and some think they kidnapped Jeremiah the prophet and took him to Egypt with them. And so the Jewish faith um, progressed and blossomed in Egypt, Libya, and all, all down in Africa. And it says Libya, Egypt, and then a lot of the people had moved to Rome. Okay, they were officials or whatever, or well to do, and they moved to Rome. And then we have Nero crucifying a bunch of Jews and blaming you know, them for uh, destruction. And uh, so there's a lot of Jews in, in Rome, so some of those Jews from Rome came there. And then lastly, the Cretans, there were a bunch on the Isle of Crete. And so as we look at these, at, at these and Cretans right there in the center of uh, the Mediterranean, so Italy, North Africa, Turkey, Iran, uh, Iraq, uh, Saudi Arabia, all those places had people at Pentecost, and they heard them in their own tongues. So those are the language of the dialectos that were used. Let's just wrap this up in just two quick points. Uh, verses 7 to 13, how did they respond? But well, we already read the one. The one was open-minded and questioning. You know, their questions were verse 7, aren't these Galileans? Verse 8, how is it we hear them in our own language of which we were born, our native dialect? And then verse 12, what does this mean? They're questioning. And then, of course, you always have those that are on the other side. You have those that are open to God and those that are closed-minded to God. And the closed-minded people, they mocked them. They were mocking them. They're all a bucket of drunks. They're just drinking. And so Peter gets up to set him straight. He assumes leadership, a little different than being, you know, denying Jesus in the, gar in the, uh, in the trial. And he assumes the leadership. He says, they're not drunk. Today is a holy day, Pentecost. And normally Jews do not even eat until between 10 o'clock and noon 
they don't, they don't eat in the morning. He says, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. How can I be drunk? You know, they haven't eaten anything. Nobody gets drunk at 9 o'clock in the morning. So he says, that's not the explanation. And then he goes on, and it says, uh, I find it interesting. What did they accuse Jesus Christ of? Listen to Matthew eleven nineteen. The Son of Man came eating and drinking, and they say, Behold, a gluttonous man and a drunkard, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. So they've tried to call him a drunkard also. So their explanation is, Christians are drunk. That's why they have these crazy ideas and do this crazy stuff. Peter stands up and says, No. He says, Do you remember in Joel? There's this prophecy, and he gives the prophecy of how in Joel... Um, they would speak with, they would, they would have dream dreams, they'd have visions and all that, and that's going to take place at the end of time. But he's using that as an illustration, saying, this is what happens when the Holy Spirit impacts us. And he says, right now, the Holy Spirit's impacting us, and they are the reason for what's happening, not the fact that these guys are drunk. And in fact, Paul picks up on that in Ephesians 5, 19, 18, right? Don't be drunk with wine, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. What's the difference between the two? Well, they're both totally controlling. If you're drunk, what, what are you under control of? Alcohol. It's controlling. You have no, no control of yourself. You're vomiting. You're maybe defecating. I mean, you're, you, don't have, you don't have control of your own self. If you're under the control of the Holy Spirit, guess what? You also don't have control of your Holy Self. So as a drunk allows wine to take control of him, so we should allow the Holy Spirit to take control of our lives. And he should transform our lives. He will transform what we do, what we say, what we think, how we act, how we do business. That's what the Holy Spirit should do in our life. My theme at the, this, for this morning is the power of the Holy Spirit makes us bold witnesses for Jesus. That was the idea. The power of the Holy Spirit would come, you'd have the Holy Spirit, and you'd be bold witnesses for me in Jerusalem, Judea, and all these other places. The key of this passage, while we spend some time describing tongues, because a lot of people don't misunderstand them today. They, they have other stuff. They don't look at the scriptures to really understand what tongues are. We talked a little bit about that. But the key of this passage is not tongues. Tongues were simply an evidence that these people had what? The power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit is the topic of this text. 1 Corinthians 12, 7. It says that the Spirit gave us gifts for the common good. The Holy Spirit empowers us for service. King Solomon received the Holy Spirit and then lost it, remember? David said in Psalm 51, please do not take your spirit from me. In the Old Testament, he came and went, but with us he stays. So the question for us today is, are you empowered by the Holy Spirit? Sin can lessen the Holy Spirit's effect on us. That's the one thing that keeps the Holy Spirit from controlling our life. Acts says, you have the same power that those disciples had. You have the power to preach, the power to live for God's life. And you don't need some future experience to get it. You got it at the moment of salvation. Now act like it. Now use it. The Holy Spirit was given us for service and for power. So my question is, how are you witnessing for God? How are you serving God? Because if not, you're wasting the two main jobs that the Holy Spirit was given to you for. There's a third one also, sealing us till the day of redemption. How is the Holy Spirit working in your life? Look at Acts 2 and say, I'm not seeking some other gift or something else. I want to receive the power of the Holy Spirit today in my life to be able to go out and do what God wants me to do both out there and inside the church. Dear Lord, we ask for your blessing over us. We ask that you might help us to really look at this passage properly and look for the power that you have given each one of us, not because we have some experience or some other work of grace or anything else happening in our lives, but we have the power of the Holy Spirit because we have been indwelt by you and you have given us that spirit to do work for you. May this week we do the work your work in the power of the Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen.